Let us pray. Holy God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may see and hear what you have for us this day. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our salvation. Amen. A forest ranger described the most common question that visitors at his park ask forest rangers. Many people, he said, come to the park to hike one of the beautiful trails that wander through the forest. Trails designed to display magnificent trees and foliage, to let the hikers encounter an array of wildlife in the forest, and to take hikers on to hilltops for breathtaking views of the countryside. But the most frequent question that visitors ask the forest rangers is not where does this trail go or how long does it take to hike it or my favorite do you need to take bug spray on the trail but instead the most popular question is excuse me can you tell me where the trail starts it makes sense no matter how lovely or breathtaking the trail may be, if you don't know where the trail starts, you can't take it. So I begin today here on Trinity Sunday because it's a day that the church's calendar lifts up a doctrine of the church, the doctrine of the Trinity, and proclaim that God is not one God, God alone, but that God is in three persons formerly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or you could think of it as Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Quite understandably, you may consider the Trinity to be rather abstract or remote or something that others ponder or pontificate, something that is of little concern to us and how we live our everyday lives. But I don't think that's true. The doctrine of the Trinity is actually like a trail in a deep and mysterious forest called the life of God. If we walk this trail called the Trinity, we will see and experience amazing things. We will discover something of what God is truly like in all of God's beauty and wildness and splendor. When we walk this trail in the forest called Trinity, we see that God is not like what many people think. Well, some people think, God is like a great big parent, a father or a mother in the sky, or maybe a fearsome judge who stares down and makes us behave out of fear or guilt. Others think God is like a divine clockmaker who made creation and wound it up and then let it tick on its way. Others think God is some distant star, cold or unblinking, shining out there somewhere but far away from us and our lives. But when we walk the trail called the Trinity, we discover that God is not a fearsome judge or a clockmaker or a distant star, but God is rather a community of people in a living and dynamic communion of love and self-giving. The life that God has in God's being is a life which all three relate to one another, give to one another, and love each other. Remember the forest ranger who knows where the trail starts? We can't go far without knowing where this life with God begins. Which brings us to Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a pretty devout religious leader, one of the best. He's a Pharisee and among the high religious courts called the Sanhedrin. He knows Jewish law inside and out. Now there is sometimes a difference between being religious, even being a religious leader, and actually knowing God. Nicodemus is a very public, has a very public commitment to God on the outside. But he wants, maybe as many of us do, something more something deeper, a relationship with God on the inside. 
Nicodemus wants to walk the trail into that mysterious forest that is God. Nicodemus comes to Jesus secretly under the cover of darkness to say, you come from God, Jesus. Everyone can see it. I want to know God too. I really want to know God. I want God in my life. But how do I begin? Well, what is Nicodemus really saying? Where does the trail start? However, Jesus responds to Nicodemus. He doesn't, Nicodemus doesn't seem to get what Jesus is saying. Jesus says, Nicodemus, you don't need God to come into your life. You have it backwards. You need to come into God's life. God doesn't come into your life. It works the other way. God offers us God's own life as a gift and beckons us to enter it. You need to be in the life of God. In fact, Nicodemus, you need to be born all over again, this time born of God's life. I don't know how to do that, Nicodemus says. I don't know how to be born all over again into the life of God. Well, Jesus says, I know you don't know. Well, there's good news for you, though, Nicodemus. The life of God is not far away from you. The life of God has come near to you. Indeed, the life of God is sitting right next to you, speaking to you now. The love that binds all three parts of God together has spilled out into the world in Jesus. God so loved the world that God gave God's only son, given a son not to condemn the world, but to save it, given a son as a way into the fullness of the life of God. So, if you are looking for a good place to start, Jesus is where that trail begins, the trail that leads us into a joyful and loving life with God. Believe it or not, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about the Trinity in the last few weeks, not as a theological ideal, but as a way of experiencing God as deeply historical and personal and rooted in community. It's a community geared toward the future. The Trinity helps us imagine what the kingdom of God is like. It's a lens through which we gaze. It's how we think about the interconnectedness and the relationship of the holy and of the holiest things. For me, God is deeply historical, and God is very constant. God is the same over and over. God is also very consistent, and God is consistent in the event of Jesus Christ. And God is always looking forward and to be rooted in community. As we seek to be followers of Jesus, we have to ask more than what the wristband of the 1990s would say, what would Jesus do? But to be drawn into the communion of the fullness of God's life. We are baptized into the whole life of Christ, life, death, and resurrection. To belong to Christ is to belong to his whole family. To be, drawn through Christ, to, to be drawn through Jesus the Son into a deep and loving relationship with God, the parent in the power of the Spirit. The sacrament of baptism is a rebirth into a new way of life. And so I share a baptism story with you. There was once a minister baptizing a two-year-old boy. After the child had been baptized with water, the minister puts his hand on the little boy's head and addresses him with a very Trinitarian language. He said, you are a child of God, sealed by the Spirit in your baptism, and you belong to Jesus Christ forever. Well, very unexpectedly, the little boy looked up and responded, uh-oh. Well, the parents chuckled. And the congregation smiled, and the minister reflected on what was a very appropriate response, a stunningly theological affirmation from this young man. That uh-oh was the recognition that everything had changed. 
that this boy would never be the same. Well, I think it may be hard for parents to believe that at their very moment, their son didn't belong just to his biological family anymore, but he now belonged and was born all over again, and he belonged into God's, God's family, God's Trinitarian family. Now he would be called to live out in the world the same kind of love, the same kind of self-giving that goes on among the three entities of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Parent, Child, Spirit. I like to think Jesus also entrusted these teachings to Nicodemus because he saw his potential. Nicodemus knows the Father and the Creator God and the one true God of Israel who sustained and delivered the Israelites, those dwelling in the Holy Temple. But to Jesus, there are two things that Nicodemus still needs, to know the Son and to receive the Spirit in whom God comes close. What Jesus offers Nicodemus is an invitation to know God's other dimensions more deeply, to experience an inner renewal through the Spirit, and to help build a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus' invitation seems to upend everything Nicodemus knows and believes. It's an uh uh-oh moment for Nicodemus, one that would open his understanding and deepen his faith. We will see Nicodemus again when the Sanhedrin is trying to decide what to do with this radical Jesus. Nicodemus pleads with the others to give the man a fair trial. The second time we see Nicodemus is when he joins Joseph of Arimathea to prepare and anoint Jesus' body for burial. We don't really know his intentions. Was it just reverential or worshipful? Was he sad at the death of a great teacher? Or had he been changed through this encounter with Jesus? And therefore, did he see a bit more clearly the kingdom of God? I find Nicodemus' story powerful, certainly not easy and devoid of a very clear ending but powerful nonetheless. And his story is a story for all of us, whose walks of faith seem to contain more questions than answers. For all of us who spend more time than we would care to admit wrestling with our faith. For all of us who stare up at the darkened sky at night and wonder how God sent God's very own self into this tattered and broken world to make it whole. It's also a story for those of us who come to Jesus in the night times, the night times of our lives, who come to Jesus in the shadowy darkness, yet who say to Jesus, along with the disciples, to whom else would I go? And yet wherever you find yourself this morning, wherever in the darkness or in the light, Jesus shares with us the same powerful words. Here's what he says one more time, because it can't be said enough. That God so loved the world, that God gave God's only son, so that whoever believes in him may never perish, but have eternal life. This son, Jesus Christ, opens his arms wide open to welcome us into the very life of God. The trail into God's own life starts here. Thanks be to God.